How's it going everyone? Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm talking about Badland Hunters, the new Netflix film from Korea, directed by Hugh Mung Hang in his directorial debut. Set in a post-apocalyptic soul, it's actually a sequel to a movie called Concrete Utopia, which I will confess I am ignorant of. In any case, this one centers around a wasteland hunter played by the priceless Don Lee, and I'm gonna gush about him some more in a second, but we'll get there. We will get there. But as I said, he is a post-apocalyptic wasteland hunter who traps wild game and sells it in a small encampment village where he lives for trade. One day he and his partner meet and take a liking to a girl named Suna and her family. And subsequently, when Suna and her grandmother are kidnapped by an evil doctor under the pretense of being promised rehabilitation in a healthy new apartment building, Don Lee and his hunting partner, also very well played, venture out to the apartment building to try and rescue Suna. That's not a spoiler, by the way, it's in the synopsis and the promotional trailers that that starts happening. And honestly, even if you had not seen any promotional material for this movie or read anything about it, it wouldn't take you very long to figure out what's really going on when these nice people show up to the camp and seem to be apparently offering some of these people an upgrade in their life just out of the goodness of their hearts, because we all know how credible the goodness of the heart is in a post-apocalyptic situation, right? Anyway, good news is, even if this movie is not going to blow your hair back with any big surprises, it is a lot of fun. It's entertaining as hell, even if it could have been trimmed down, I think, to a more lean 90-minute runtime. This does have a slow and somewhat meandering opening act. There's really no way around that for me, unfortunately. And I think that it was kind of because they were really trying to belabor the point that they had about how the medical community and other elite members of our society often exploit class-based ignorance. Which is a reliable enough angle to take in a movie like this, even if it is becoming a bit of a trope. But unfortunately, beyond the initial point about that exploitation, I don't really feel like the movie has much else to say about it. It seems to think that it does, but all it's really doing is drawing that one point out. Even though this passage of the movie is interspersed with some dynamite action segments, it still feels like a bit of an unnecessary detour. Especially with the more powerful and personal nature of the Evil Doctor's storyline, which I'll get into more in the spoilers. I already feel like that's enough to make this compelling. I don't feel like that broader point was necessary. Fortunately, our principal cast is well cast and played enough and appealing enough that it helps to offset some of the extra baggage that could have been done away with in those opening scenes. These characters all feel very human and earnest and the charismatic or show-offy approach to the action scenes would have made it feel just very grating, but because these characters are as likable as they are, and have a certain dogged humility about themselves and a certain self-deprecating sense of humor. It makes them rootable and compelling in the action scenes instead of walking items of like vanity worship or something. And Don Lee, I mean, holy crap, what a treasure. Not just a national treasure, an international treasure. This guy is one of my favorite action leads to emerge over the last 10 years or so. First of all, he has the laid back physical swagger and confidence of a guy like Schwarzenegger and the big frame to match. But he couples that with the more grounded, everyman temperament of a character like Bruce Willis in Die Hard or Mel Gibson in the first couple of Lethal Weapon movies. If you're a fan of 80s action stars, this guy gives you the best of both those worlds. He almost feels like a Korean Jonathan Banks at times. He's got that same sort of rugged bemusement about everything that made Mike Ehrmantraut stand out and be so memorable in Breaking Bad. He's the kind of guy who, rather than flex and warn you in a more overtly macho way about what he could do to you, will threaten you in a very workmanlike, matter-of-fact way. In fact, at the end of an opening action scene in this movie, Don Lee goes up to the guys post-beatdown and essentially tells them about as calmly and politely as anyone could that, you know, no offense, but if you guys do happen to come back here, um, your ass is getting beaten, even worse. I'll probably kill you. Without ever trying to, Don Lee is able to convince you that he really is that tough. He's so confident in his toughness that he doesn't need to remind anyone. He deliberately lacks a sense of sort of precision or urgency whenever he's dealing with anyone or trying to deflect a threat or whatever it might be 
because he knows that he can handle himself no matter what and he doesn't need to remind anyone but he will be very happy to show you firsthand if you question that even for a second. I'm honestly still trying to figure out how a guy who performs in such an unassuming grounded way and always resists the temptation to chew the scenery even in a movie like this still manages to exude such sheer undisputed star power. Like this guy absolutely is a star. I don't think anyone will remember his character here quite as fondly as the character he played in Train to Busan. This is still a very competent vehicle for his charisma. Lee Hee Joon as the evil troubled doctor is not necessarily as well known to North American audiences as Don Lee at this point. This movie does give him a good opportunity to break out and strut his own stuff as an actor as well. As the doctor, this guy perfectly affects that glassy, cold, detached facade that a lot of people like that do put up to the public. Even though underneath it all, this guy is clinging to the very faintest shred of sanity and humanity. For reasons that again the spoilers will touch on, but for now, just know that watching this guy's facade and confidence and sense of control over his little empire slowly crumble is fascinating to watch. There's one brilliant shot where you're tracking him with him facing the camera and it's pulling back as he walks down a long hallway and every step he takes, he's trying just a little bit harder to pull himself together and become composed before he goes out and tries to explain to a couple of parents what has happened to their daughter. Then when the doctor finally snaps and his sanity collapses in a brilliant moment at the end, Lee Hu Jun just goes for broke with sweat tears and some big huge Denzel Washington training day end of movie meltdown style goobers of spit just hanging off his lips and flying everywhere. I mean he looks like a junkyard bulldog. And then it caps off with a note of perfect poetic justice for his character which ends up elevating what was up until that moment pretty much a fairly derivative element to his character. I'm being vague again but I will touch on this in the spoilers. Although, as long as I am talking about things being derivative, I might as well mention my other criticism of the movie in addition to some of the early excesses of the plot, which is just kind of an overall lack of originality. Besides a lot of on-the-nose walking dead worship in terms of certain dynamics of this post-apocalyptic world, I also counted a lot of things derived from movies like Dread, Martyrs, Reanimator, Mad Max, of course, I mean, there's inevitably going to be a Mad Max, not in any post-apocalyptic movie. Overlord from 2018, I mean, I could go on and on. All assembled and executed fairly well, but also not going to change the world either. To be fair, I feel like you can probably chalk a lot of that up to this being Hyo Mong Heng's directorial debut, and he demonstrates here that he is a capable director. I would just sort of say that maybe for his next outing, if he continues down this path, maybe he should try to choose something that is a little bit more ambitious and original and creative in terms of its actual script content. The one area where he definitely does not need to brush up or change gears is his action choreography. And who boy, this is where a movie like this counts and this is where this movie delivers. Like, full throttle, firing on every single goddamn cylinder. It is early in the year, but I have a feeling that this might be some of the best fight and action choreography we will see from a Netflix movie in 2024. The action choreography is handheld but never shaky cam. There's never any extreme close-ups. You always have a good sense of the action. It's fluid, coherent. Various characters fight slightly differently according to their background. The military characters fight like soldiers. The hunters fight like hunters. Everyone's movements feel very deliberate and precise and like every punch and kick carries weight without ever feeling pretentiously choppy. And it's just exaggerated enough to feel cinematic. This is probably honestly the most fun I've had watching action scenes since the Netflix film Day Shift with Jamie Foxx. So while Badland Hunters could have been slightly tighter in its runtime, and it doesn't quite stick the landing on some of its loftier ambitions, it's still a fun, entertaining action romp. It's the kind of movie that if it was playing theatrically would be a great matinee. And Don Lee, once again, in my opinion, is well on track to being the king of the hill of the action stars. And with that, everyone, I think I'm going to dive into spoilers now. 
if you're new to my channel, I'll just reiterate that I don't generally summarize plot synopsis in my spoilers unless I just kind of feel compelled to. I'm mainly just mulling over the points that stood out to me. So if you're looking for a synopsis, you won't be getting that here. But if you still feel like hanging out to hear me chat about one or two bullet points, make yourself comfortable. And with that, here come the spoilers. So yes, once again, you don't have to be a genius to guess that once those suits show up and start offering to give these villagers new lives in the land of milk and honey, that there's actually some sort of a meat grinder or something waiting for them on the other end of this particular rainbow. When you find out the doctor is giving all these kids this doctored water and trying to essentially farm them and enhance them into becoming more efficient and durable human beings, that's the part that felt vaguely martyrs inspired to me because because in both movies you have someone who is essentially pursuing immortality or even just trying to confirm that immortality exists and is possible by abusing kids. At this point, we do already know, of course, that the doctor lost his daughter. I mean, that's what the movie opens up with. You kind of assume that it's a tragic twist for his character because he's become inspired to pursue immortality because he is shaken by the loss of his child. But she's not quite dead. And in fact, he still has her alive and encased in a glass tank hidden deep in his office for no one else to see. Does this sound familiar? A guy who appears affable and friendly towards the community, but is secretly a psychopath hiding his daughter's head in his office? No prizes for guessing this one, okay? I mean, if you had called him Dr. Governor, there would be no reason to call him something that stupid, but at that point I would have just said, sure, you're already hitting it right on the nose. Yeah, I'll allow it. To be fair, that kind of plot does predate The Walking Dead, but nevertheless, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the writers were not thinking of obscure French horror movies when they introduced that element into the screenplay. But when you find out that he isn't doing this in pursuit of immortality in theory, but rather that he is literally pooling every single resource that he can out of these children to keep his own daughter alive and thriving, that's when his character's psychosis crosses over from simply being evil and misguided and becomes truly tragic. While no sane viewer could ever justify his methods and his response to losing his daughter, most of us can probably relate to how he got to that point. I don't approve of what this guy does, but I can understand why he's doing it. And that's the mark of a well-rounded performance and a well-rounded villain. I also would be remiss if I didn't talk about a small moment when the doctor discovers that Suna has been hiding and has witnessed not only the death of her young friend Zhu Ye, but also the subsequent murder of Zhu Ye's parents. As soon as he sees her, the jumpy way that he just shifts back into Dr. Oz mode is chilling. When he has his big meltdown at the end and sprays down that crowd with the machine gun and ends up accidentally tagging his own daughter's head in that suitcase he put her in, it's a perfect note of tragic irony. I mean, from the second that that daughter showed up in that glass case, even more so once they put her in the suitcase to roll her down the hallway when they were trying to escape, you just knew that that was going to get broken or busted or penetrated somehow. You don't necessarily expect it to be the doctor shooting his own daughter. But hey, this might not be the ending that he wanted, but it's certainly the ending he deserves. The only thing that could have made it just a bit better and make the ending have a little more impact would have been if there was some way to create a little more direct conflict between Don Lee and the doctor. Because as good as Don Lee is, when you come right down to it, this isn't quite his character's story as much as it is Suna's story. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, I suppose, but when you have two performances that are this powerful and this charismatic and commanding, it makes sense, at least to me, that you would want to draw them closer together for the climax. Yes, they do have a confrontation, and yes, Don Lee socks it to him, but it doesn't have as much impact as it could have had if these guys had a more direct personal reason for like, you know, hating each other or wanting to get each other. But given the sheer awesomeness of the last half hour of action in this movie, that is still ultimately a nitpick for me. 
I honestly can't predict if we'll get another entry in this series or not. The way that this one ends, it doesn't feel like it necessarily begs for a sequel. Although I have to say, these characters are all so likable and have such a nice, contagious energy about them. I wouldn't mind having another go around with them in an adventure, even if it was just sort of more of an anthology entry rather than a direct sequel. I think that's about all I can say about this one at this point. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Keep your eyes on the channel for more new content soon. Hope you're all enjoying your Sunday, and I will see you next time.